Okay, hi everybody. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Positive Choices webinar series. Um, my name is Lucy and I'm a research assistant on the Positive Choices project and I'll be chairing the webinar session today. So today's webinar will focus on the relationship between social media, alcohol use and parental monitoring across adolescents. Um, at Positive Choices, our aim is to assist parents, teachers and students across Australia to access up-to-date and accurate information about alcohol and other drugs. This webinar series is one way we try to achieve this aim. We will be hosting another webinar later in the year, so please subscribe to the Positive Choices newsletter by going to our website and you'll be notified when we have more details about this webinar. Over the series so far, we've covered a number of topics, such as how parents can keep their teenagers safe at parties. Um, and if you missed this or any other sessions, you can um, watch on demand um, at our website. So just some housekeeping before we start. Um, you're currently in listen-only mode, um, which means we can't hear you. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Positive Choices portal um, along with the handout of the slides. And we will have a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. So please just type your questions using um, the Q&A box available. If you haven't already visited the Positive Choices website, I would encourage you to um, take a look at the range of evidence-based drug resources that are available. Positive Choices was developed in consultation with young people, teachers and parents, and we'd appreciate your feedback on anything additional you'd like to see on the site. Or if you'd like to suggest a future webinar topic, please email us on info at positivechoices.org.au. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Miss Anna Smout. Anna is a doctoral candidate and research assistant at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. She currently works on the Climate and Prevention Study, a longitudinal randomised controlled trial that has followed approximately 2,000 students from age 13 to age 20. The findings she is reporting are using the Climate and Prevention dataset. Anna's PhD research is looking at the development of mental health and substance use with a focus on risky behaviours. So thank you, Anna. I'll just pass it over now. Cool, thanks, Lucy. Um, I'll just share my screen. Alrighty. Cool. Um, so thanks for uh, everyone for coming along today, tuning in. Um, as Lucy said, my name is Anna Smout and I'm a PhD candidate with the Matilda Centre. Um, what I'll be presenting on today is uh, forms part of my doctoral thesis. Um, just a note that it's actually, it's unpublished at the moment. So if you could refrain from posting any results anywhere, that would be great. Um, at this point, I'd firstly like to acknowledge and thank all those who contributed to this research, um, in particular the students and schools who generously participated in the study. It's a really big team, um, as you can see, and the project has actually been running since 2012. Um, we'll start off with a bit of context around social networking. Um, it'll be no surprise, I'm sure, that um, about 8 in 10 Australians are currently using social media. Um, this number is even higher among teens, so up to 99% in those aged 14 to 17. And on average, teens are spending three or more hours per day on social networking sites, visiting their favourite sites 50 or more times um, per day, and their favourite sites being Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. So research has found that more time spent on social networking sites has been associated with an increased frequency of drinking among adolescents. And authors have identified um, alcohol-related content generated by peers as one particularly critical factor in this relationship. This is due to the fact that they um, bias and inflate uh, perceived peer drinking norms. And in studies that analyze the content of social media profiles, they find that actually most profiles contain some reference to alcohol use. Um, usually it's pictures or text portraying consumption or being drunk or hungover and usually in a positive or humorous light. Um, at this point, we'll touch on the poll. Lucy, did you launch the poll at the start of the, yep. I'm just about to launch it now. Okay, cool. We'll just do a quick poll. Um, 
So what percentage of Australian parents never monitor their child's social media use? Um, so if you just vote on what number you think is the closest, your closest and best guess, and we'll reveal the answer in a minute. Great, thanks Anna. So we've had most people answered now. Um, do you want me to reveal the results now? A little um, yes, you yeah. can reveal that now if you like. So we actually had an equal split. So mm -hmm. 4% um, of our attendees said 60% never monitor and another 44% said 75% never monitor. Great, nice job everyone. Um, that's actually correct. So I think it's really surprising that considering this huge amount of time that younger teens are spending on social media, it's a bit surprising that according to both parent and teen reports, 60% of Australian parents reportedly never monitor their child's social networking site use. Um, so we'll just touch um, now on what we actually mean by monitoring. So um, despite what it might sound like, we're not actually talking about, you know, um, looking over um, anyone's shoulder or overstepping any boundaries. Um, it's in the, in the literature, it's usually referred to as parent mediation um, and distinctions are made between a couple of types. So one type is active mediation, which is more about engaging adolescents or, or children in um, uh, critical discussion about what they're seeing on social, on social media. Restrictive, which is more about um, placing limits on the amount of time or the specific content they're allowed to engage with and co-use, which is more about um, using at the same time. And despite the protective influence that we know parents can and do have on the adolescent's engagement and risk behaviours, including alcohol use, um, the effect of parent monitoring of social media use on drinking actually remains largely overlooked. So that brings us to our present study. Um, so the current study aimed to address some of these gaps in the literature to date. Firstly, because we already know from past research that more time spent on social media is linked to an increased frequency of drinking, um, we also wanted to look here at the effect of exposure to images of peers engaging in risky substance use on drinking frequency, um, so not just time spent on social media. Um, and after doing this, we then wanted to look at the effect of parent monitoring on these two relationships. So um, does parent monitoring affect the relationships between time spent and drinking frequency and then exposure to content and drinking frequency? Um, and thirdly, research examining the link between social media use and drinking is commonly um, at the moment conducted among older adolescents or university samples. Um, and so for the present study, we wanted to look at this in a younger age group or from earlier in age to establish whether there's an opportunity here for prevention. So I'll just quickly run you through um, the participants and method. Um, so analyses for this study um, made use of data collected from students who participated in a study designed to assess the effectiveness of a drug and alcohol prevention program. Um, this was called Climate and Prevention or CAP for short. Um, and this study began in 2012 and we're actually still collecting data today, seven years on. So for this presentation, we're only using um, age 13 data from participants who were allocated to the control group of the study. This means that during the study, they actually didn't receive um, the prevention program and we use control group participants so that we know that any effects we're finding um, are not affected by whether or not they received the prevention program. So data was collected from students in surveys online in class um, from the age of 13 up to 16, but again, we're just using um, age 13 data. Um, final number of participants was 527, 65% female on average 13 years old. Quickly running through how we measured our variables of interest. Um, when we say drinking frequency, we're talking about the number of days per month that a standard drink was consumed over the past six months. Social media was measured two ways. Firstly, through hours spent per day using social media. And secondly, um, yes or no, whether or not kids reported seeing pictures of their peers drunk, passed out or using drugs on social networking sites. Parent monitoring was assessed through the item, does your parent monitor your social networking site use, yes or no? And finally, because we know that they are associated with increased drinking in adolescence, 
In our analyses, we also took into account uh, participant sex and four personality risk factors that are associated with increased drinking. Um, these are impulsivity, sensation seeking, hopelessness, and anxiety sensitivity. And we want to take these into account so that we know that um, any effects we find linking social networking site use and drinking frequency are not just a product of um, differences in participant sex or persona personality. So to look at these relationships, we use a statistical technique called regression. There are heaps of different types um, of regression analyses, but at their core, um, they're all examining the relationship between two or more variables of interest. Um, so uh, a number of independent variables um, and the effect of them on a dependent variable. So for our study, um, our independent variable today is social media use with our dependent variable being drinking frequency. Um, and there's one other aspect that we need to understand um, in interpreting our analyses, and that's moderation. So moderation is a way to check whether a different variable, for example, parent monitoring, influences the strength or the direction of the relationship between um, our IV and our DB. Finally, um, we include our covariates that I just mentioned, participant sex and participant personality. We include covariate, we call them covariates, um, and we include these when there's a chance they are going to affect the relationship between social networking um, and drinking frequency, and including these can improve the accuracy of our results. So, on to results. Um, so the first question uh, we wanted to ask was whether more time spent on social media is associated with uh, an increased frequency of drinking among our sample of 13 year olds. And it, yep, our covariates are in there too. So the answer to this is yes, um, and I'll quickly explain um, the interpretation of this slide. So this table is the output of a regression. Um, the furthest right column shows us the significance value or the p-value. Um, and if the p-value of the variable we're interested in is below 0 0.05, we call this statistically significant. So um, the graphs on the slides show us um, what the numbers in the regression output sort of translate to in a visual way. So the way we would interpret this output is that the graph is showing us that at age 13, more time spent on social media is associated with an increased frequency of drinking. And we know that this result is statistically significant because our p-value is below 0 0.05. So this is in line with the previous research that we discussed earlier, um, linking drinking frequency with social networking site use, and shows us that this is occurring um, as young as the age of 13. So our next question we wanted to ask, uh, we wanted to answer um, was, <clears throat> sorry, does seeing images of others moderate the relationship between time spent on social media and drinking frequency? And again, we've got our covariates in there. So the answer here again was yes. Um, this was statistically significant. So um, looking at our graph, the blue line is uh, depicting the people who did see images of risky substance use. And for this group, more time spent on social media is still associated with an increased frequency of drinking. However, when we look at the red line or people who didn't see images, um, amongst those people, this relationship has is basically re is very reduced. So from this, we can see that while more social media hours per day is predicting an increased frequency of drinking, this is occurring actually only among the adolescents who report seeing images of their peers drunk, passed out or using drugs. So we've established here that both the amount of time spent on social media and the content kids are exposed to are having some influence on drinking frequency. So next, uh, we want to see what happens when we include parent monitoring um, in our models. So our first uh, question, looking at parent monitoring, does parent monitoring of social media use moderate the relationship between time spent on social media and drinking frequency? So the answer to this one was a bit more complex. It's a yes, sort of. Um, so this result was initially significant. Um, looking first at the red line on our graph, we can see that without any parent monitoring, more time spent on social media 
is associated with an increased frequency of drinking. However, when we look at the blue line, we can see that the presence of um, any parent monitoring appears to reduce the strength of this relationship. However, once we added our covariates into the model, um, this was no longer statistically significant. So it's hard to say exactly uh, what this means, but what it's telling us is that um, it seems p participant sex and personality are also important factors in this relationship. So our second and final parent monitoring question, um, does parent monitoring of social me media use moderate the relationship between seeing images of peers drunk, passed out, or using drugs, um, and drinking frequency. And again, finally, we have our covariates. So the answer to this one again was yes. Uh, this result was significant. So this, this graph is a little bit harder, a little bit more complex to interpret. Um, it helps if you look at the red, uh, two red bars together and then the two blue bars together and imagine a line connecting them both. Um, Basically, looking at the red bars, they show us that in the absence of parent monitoring, seeing images of other kids drunk or passed out is associated with a higher frequency of drinking. But in the presence of parent monitoring, um, this appears, uh, this is counteracted. So, um, a quick summary of our findings. Um, Firstly, we've replicated findings linking social media use or time spent on social media and drinking frequency. And we found that this is occurring in as young um, as the age of 13. However, um, it's interesting to note that actually seeing images of peers drunk, passed out, or using drugs actually moderated this relationship such that um, more time spent on social media predicted increased drinking frequency, but only among those who were exposed to images. Um, parent monitoring also reduced the strength of the relationship between seeing images of friends drunk, passed out, or using drugs, and increased drinking frequency. So what does this all mean for us? Um, firstly, um, I suppose it goes without saying that yes, we should continue um, aiming to reduce social media use among our young adolescents due to its association with increased drinking, but um, until now, we maybe weren't aware that it was occurring as young as age 13. So start early. <laughs> um, these findings also suggest that the perception of parent monitoring might be a benefit at this early age. So um, as we just saw, we, we saw that seeing images was an important predictor of drinking frequency, even in the statistical models that included um, time spent on social media, and further that parent monitoring reduced the positive association between seeing images and drinking frequency. So because of all this, um, we might then hypothesize that active monitoring methods or methods that involve um, encouraging adolescents to think critically about what they're seeing on social media might have more beneficial outcomes for drinking frequency than simply just restricting the amount of time they're allowed to spend on social networking sites. Given uh, the exploratory nature of the items in our study, um, we didn't actually gather any data um, in reference to the specific type or amount of parent monitoring. The next step would be to explore outcomes differentially according to um, monitoring amount and type. And so what about later in adolescence? Um, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have time today to cover this in our presentation, but we've also run these uh, cross-sectional analyses in this sample across the ages of 14, 15, and 16. And we've also run some uh, longitudinal analyses as well. Um, so what we actually found was that the results we saw today at age 13 are actually not as strong across later ages of 14, 15, and 16. And further, um, we found that seeing images at age 13 was actually um, associated with an increased frequency of drinking across the ages of 14, 15, and 16. However, um, parent monitoring at age 13 did not um, significantly affect drinking frequency across the longer term. Um, so in other words, what we can, what we can bring all of this together and say is that it, it's pointing to an early window of influence for parents in early adolescence where the influence of um, social networking site content on behavioral outcomes might be a little bit stronger 
than in later years and in parallel um, across adolescent development we might need to think of some alternative ways to intervene when it comes to disrupting um, the connection between early expo um, yeah, disrupting the connection between early exposure to content depicting risky behaviors um, on the related behavioral outcomes so you know as the behavior becomes more normative in, in real life situations, um, perhaps real life exposure takes precedent. However, at younger ages, when they're receiving less real life exposure, it might be that what they're seeing on social media is more influential at that early age. Um, just a couple of limitations of the present study um, to mention. So um, all these analyses today were cross-sectional analyses, so we, we cannot infer causality from these. Um, just because the variables are significantly associated with one another does not necessarily mean they cause each other. Um, we also had a reliance on student self-report. Um, so it's possible that, for example, some parents might have used some monitoring techniques that um, their kids weren't aware of. Um, for example, making a Facebook profile and befriending them or something like that. Um, so future research would benefit from having both child and parent reports of monitoring. Um, and finally, um, next time, as I mentioned earlier, we'd like to probably gather more data about monitoring a mountain type. Um, we're in the final stages of writing up these findings for publication um, and upon acceptance we can circulate them through the positive choices communication channels. Um, this paper will contain some additional analyses um, that I just mentioned to what I've presented here. So thanks very much for listening today um, and now we will do, we've got time I think for a quick Q&A. Yeah, yes, thanks. great. Um, Thank you. Q&A. Um, so, if everyone would like to um, type a question you might have into the um, Q&A box in your control panel, I can pass that on to Anna. Okay, so a couple of early questions. Um, Anna, could you give an example of the different types of monitoring that you spoke about? So, active, restrictive and co-use. Sure. Um, so active, um, active monitoring, um, as we mentioned, is sort of encouraging kids to think critically about what their friends or acquaintances are posting on social media. So um, how much do they think this is a true representation of their lives? Um, having open communication about their experience with social media. So um, you could, you know, things like um, how, how does this benefit you? Why do you enjoy using social media? Um, is there anything you don't like about social media? And then another really important part of active monitoring is talking about uh, cyber safety in general. So um, the classic examples of only visiting trusted sites, being careful about the type of content you're sharing and who you're sharing it with, telling an adult if something seems wrong, basically just opening, opening a, um, a, a back and forth dialogue where it feels um, feels like they're heard and not um, just perhaps being told what to do. Restrictive monitoring is more about, um, yeah, restricting the, the amount of time they're allowed to spend on social networking sites. It might be that they're not allowed to use it in the evening or um, they're only allowed to use it in shared areas. Um, no computers in bedrooms, no social media after bedtime, things like that. Um, and then co-use, it's mentioned a lot in the general media literature. It's perhaps less um, applicable to social media, but um, it's like uh, watching TV together or watching movies together or playing video games together. So you're using it at the same time. You probably could do this to some extent with social media, like sitting down together and talking through a few social media profiles. Um, but yeah, generally it's more about... Um, engaging yeah, together through shared interest in, in some type of media. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. Um, and we've had another question come in about um, how would I start a conversation um, with my child about alcohol um, and or social media use? Yeah, um, it can always be a bit difficult, I imagine. <laughs> I, a good technique, um, a good technique that I've seen um, talked about in a few in a few of these um, papers is using 
current events or happenings to start a conversation. So um, when things come up on the news, um, you could say something like, has this ever happened? Has something like this ever happened to you or happened to your friends or someone you know? Um, it's always good um, to, yeah, to let it sort of come out organically. Positive Choices also actually um, has a couple of communication guides and video demonstrations up on the website, I think, as well. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So in our um, parent uh, portal, our parent section of the portal, there are um, video demonstrations and communication guides for starting those tricky conversations um, with your children. Um, and another question for you, Anna. Um, until what age do you think parents should be monitoring their social media? Oh, sorry, their children's social media use. Yeah. Um, well, look. Um, I think uh, when we're talking when we're talking about things like engaging in critical discussion, um, you know, I can't I can't really think of any time that this would be inappropriate. Um, so I guess checking in as, as, as often as you see necessary. I mean, the conversation can also be reversed and applied both ways. So, you know, how does your social media use compare to theirs? Could you cut back to um, as a family? You know, what do you guys want to be achieving with social media or, or using it for? Um, so, yeah, I really think there's, there's no age where the no age that's too old. <laughs> Um, another question has come through um, regarding so the age of um, the students in your sample. Mm -hmm. you know, they have asked um, how many 13-year-olds in Australia are actually drinking alcohol. Is this something that um, you know from your um, results? Yeah, well, um, so in our, in our sample um, at age 13, about 11% of our sample is drinking. So the prevalence is low. Um, and this is, this is pretty, this is in accord with Australian statistics. If you'd like to see some more, there's the Australian secondary school survey. Um, is it alcohol and tobacco use? Yeah. Alcohol, alcohol and, and other drug use. ASAD, A-S-S-A-D, 2017, I think, um, which would have uh, some some more detailed information among our sample it was about 11 percent and again yes um that's a lower a low prevalence um but in the interest of prevention you know we wanting we're wanting to be getting in there early um looking at these patterns um as they're emerging um rather than when they're established um but yeah basically yeah any drinking at the age of 13 could be considered pretty risky yeah definitely um, another question has come through as to whether you think um, these sorts of findings would be applicable in other areas of health, so maybe um, tobacco use or even desired health behaviours such as healthy eating. Healthy eating? Yeah. Yeah. Um, these specific findings, you know, are pointing to very specific exposure on on social on social media use. I can't think why it wouldn't apply to anything that um, kids are exposed to on social media. So yeah, pictures of healthy lifestyle, um, which definitely comes up. Um, yeah, I would say basically, yeah. And I guess in these findings, we're seeing that, again, this might be particularly, um, the, the, the scope of influence of social media might be stronger um, before they're getting real life exposure to these behaviors. So I think as long as it's a uh, sort of unique behaviors that they're, they're not getting um, exposure to otherwise, I think there's every chance that that could influence their behavior. Great, thanks Anna. Um, I think that's all we have time for in our um, shorter half hour time slot today. But if anyone still has some questions that they'd like um, Anna's um, answer to, please just send us an email at info at positivechoices.org.au and I can pass them on. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Lucy.